Um, so, Margo, I, you know, I was really, um, I was glad that you brought up the fact that this was a story that had gone untold for so many years, because that was the, um, really the big impression that I had when yeah. I saw the movie was, how did I not know about this? This is an incredible story, mm -hmm. and the fact that it's just coming out now, um, you know, 50, 60 years later is pretty incredible. Are there other stories out there of hidden figures that we don't know about, and how do we surface those? Yeah, I, you know, it was amazing for me because growing up, so the, the longer backstory is that my dad, who's now retired, is a NASA uh, research scientist. He's an atmospheric scientist. And um, he worked with these women. We lived in this community where a lot of the people who worked at NASA were African American or female or both. And I took it for granted. It was a really fortunate situation I got to take for granted that those people were also scientists. That's what a scientist looked like, looked like my dad. Um, so I think it's a double-edged sword. You know, the people who know the stories tend to take the stories for granted mm. when, um, you know, when, when there's a moment sort of like the hidden figures uh, and other people get to know about it, then people are, are treated to this, this broader sense of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that for a long time, um, history, we had this idea that history was what the president did and the king did and the rich people and the, you know, the people at the top, when in reality, history is the sum total of what right. we all do every day. I mean, this, this is history happening right now and you know, 100 years from now, people are going to be investigating who we all are and what we came, where we came from and what we were doing in this room together. I mean, that is history as well. And I think our sensibility has changed such that now we are looking to the people in our communities and looking to um, stories of ordinary people and figuring out how each of us connects to this capital H history. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I'm actually in the process of working on a, another book, <laughs> um, which, and I, I'm always sort of fascinated by, uh, you know, this, this story of untold stories, work identity, that's something that is really, really important to me. Um, you know, my mother's an English professor, my dad uh, worked at NASA, so I grew up with two people that have very strong work identities, and it's something that I inherited and that I'm interested in. And so I think, you know, a lot of times it's just, it means stopping and thinking about, um, you know, when we see something that is like the moon landing, we see the astronauts, but we don't stop and think about everything that was required, both in terms of people and years to get to that point. And so I think if we do that, each of us in our individual lives, um, we start seeing those hidden figures and we start having a greater understanding of how each of us is connected into these larger processes and organizations. I think that's a great point. And I think, um, you know, when we typically think of, um, you know, the civil rights movement, we think of things that are very marked in history. So, um, you know, the bus boycott mm -hmm. and Selma and the you know, famous speech at the National Monument. Um, but your story picks up on something that was happening behind closed doors at work. And so what role do you think employers have in societal issues? I, I you know, I, I really think this story underscores how important what each of us does every day is in getting to those signal moments, you know, in coming to um, the March on Washington or, or the moon landing. And um, I, you know, work identity is a really powerful thing. I mean, I, this is a room full of people who work very hard, spend a lot of time thinking about work, other people's work. Um, as Americans, you know, I've spent a lot of time living outside of the United States. This thing of what you do is so powerfully connected with being American. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that um, employers understanding that, you know, and, and somehow creating a way for people to be both their individual selves, but also, you know, to connect to that work identity with as little conflict as possible. I mean, it's work, so you're, you're never going, you know, there's always going to be some conflict. But really trying to allow people to have all of their different identities inhabit mm -hmm. one silo. I think that's what all of us wants. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to be the soccer mom and the, you know, amazing programmer and the person who goes bird watching on the weekend and somehow figure out <laughs> how to make all of those things 
um, consistent with who you are as a person and, and who you see yourself. And I think that when people are able to bring more of themselves uh, to the workplace, I really think it, it benefits the work because mm -hmm. there are those parts of you um, that, you know, maybe there was something that, that came to you while you were bird watching that, um, or something about those other processes that also apply to the, to work. That's right. Do you see that happening today? Do you think there's reasons for us to be hopeful? I do. You know, I have to say I'm an optimist. Um, and I think there are a lot of times, um, you know, you wake up, you read the news. If you do that first thing in the morning, then there's just no way that you're going to have mm -hmm. uh, any kind of optimism at all. Um, so, uh, you know, essentially for, you know, and especially I feel like um, writing a book is an exercise in optimism. You know, you have to believe that you're going to finish it, that you're going to say something that someone else might find of value. So I basically stopped reading the news. <laughs> I probably won't until I my book is done. I think you're the only done. person, yeah. <laughs> um, but but I, am an, I am an optimist, you know, and I think one of the things that happens when you, when you delve into the history and you see how things have changed, mm -hmm. um, you understand that there is a capacity for change, that there is a capacity for progress, that, that each of us does have a responsibility and an opportunity to influence that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a very interesting time that we're living in, but um, you know, I think it's a very exciting time, and yeah. I think a lot of that, that change is evident in today's workplace. Yeah, and back to your point around some of these seminal moments where we identify with a certain individual or event, but then all of the other people that are making these things happen. Like, if we wanted to cast a light on the hidden figures today, where should we be looking? How can we find them? Uh, you know, that, that is a really good question. I think once you start looking, like once you go down from the top and you start understanding the building blocks of what goes in to make everything happen, um, you really do find people with good ideas and con contributing everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether that person is a bicycle messenger, as, as Melvin Butler started out, who turned out to be an extraordinarily talented human resources um, person, um, or, you know, whether that person has been trained as an engineer or software, you know, uh, specialist. But I do think this idea of providing communications tools and giving people a way to contribute their ideas, um, to have access to people who, in a previous iteration of the workplace, may have seemed totally inaccessible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's very daunting, the idea um, that anyone in your organization has access to you, but it's very exciting, and I think that is a way for, um, for all of us to find good ideas, interesting people, um, mentors, which is something that is mm -hmm. you know, really critical, I think, to the long-term success of anyone in their career. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, I, I think that having those tools and then using those tools and then, you know, just being open and listening, yeah. um, not coming to a situation or a person with those preconceived notions, whoever you are. I mean, you don't know where you're going to find your mentor. Well, exactly, and, 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 and how do we be better allies? I mean, how do we do that? How do we learn from history and, and uh, through the story of hidden figures to be better allies at working with our hidden figures? Yeah, you know, I think there, there's, you know, it's so interesting, this, this um, process of spending time with these women mm -hmm. was such an incredible gift. And Catherine, to, to spend so much time with Katherine Johnson, who's an mm -hmm. extraordinary person, um, has been wonderful. And one of the things that she said to me very early in our research, and this is something that she considers her sort of philosophy of life, and it's something that her father said to her, which is, you are no better than anyone else and no one is better than you. And, you know, when I'd ask her, well, how, you know, what was it like for you in the 1950s and, you know, you were it's the only black woman in this group or whatever, she's like, it's so simple. You are no better than anyone else mm -hmm. and no one is better than you, this mm -hmm. sort of mantra. And what it did, that having that as a part of her um, worldview kind of leveled everything, mm -hmm. you know, and what it did was it not only 
um, it not only said to her, I deserve to be here and I am you know, as prepared as anyone else, but it really allowed her to give space to everyone else and to say, okay, just because this person is different than I am, doesn't mean that um, I can't also offer them something, that I don't also owe them a little bit of space to have flaws and to um, you know, make mistakes. And it, it, it is such a powerful thing, and I really consider it one of the greatest gifts that anyone has ever given me. So there are so many times when I'm in a situation, I'll think, ah, Katherine Johnson's father mm -hmm. told her, <laughs> and it, it absolutely applies. So a lot of times when I go to colleges and, and speak to young engineering students, particularly women who feel isolated or, you know, I'm the only one, I'm like, listen, you are no better than anyone else, and no one is better than you. This was something that worked for Katherine Johnson. Look where it got her. Um, it. You know, it's tremendous advice and something that I try to take to heart all the time. I love it. Thank you so much, Margot. We really appreciate you being here today. Margot Lee Chatterley, thank you.